If you'll turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3 right quick. This is not on your sheet, but it's a good place to begin. Chapter 3, oh, and we're going to read, started verse 8 through 11. Verse 8, Paul says, To me, the very least of all believers, this grace was given. Talking about the mystery of the church. The fact that the church was never revealed in the Old Testament and was only revealed in the New Testament really to Paul. He's the one that really understood it. He got it from Jesus in the desert. And he came back and he tried to explain that this is a parenthesis in human history. It's a unique time. It'll never happen again. We actually have the opportunity to take the mind of Christ and put it within our own heart and operate as he did. His beliefs, his ideas, his thoughts, his feelings, his desires, his dislikes and likes, and all those things that were part of him can become part of us so that we literally it can make our subconscious his. Not just the outward part, but down into the core so that every natural response becomes a spiritual one. That's true transformation there. So, he says, this message was given to me and to bring to light what is the administration, now this is, uh, this is the uh, dispensations, of the mystery which for ages was hidden in God who created all things. And listen, he, said, he tells you what this was for. Why did God do this? Why did God hide the church? He says, in order that. Whenever you see a hina in order that, you know God's about to give you the reason he did it. So that the manifold, the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known or demonstrated, illustrated through our life, through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Now we know who those are. Those are the fallen angels. Those are the demons, the, the administrative system of the devil. Our life as believers in Jesus Christ are illustrations to the demonic forces of the wisdom of God and the fact that they could have had what we have. I firmly believe they could have, they, that grace was made available to them in eternity past. I'm, I'm convinced that I may be wrong. The Bible doesn't clearly state it, but it, it implies it. In our life, every time that you trust God and do the right thing, it proves they could have done that too. That volition and choosing is everything. It's everything. It's not, it's not do you believe, it's what you believe. Now, in, in this discussion about marriage and relationships, I want you to understand that your marriage or your intimate relationship is the most powerful manifestation of what God's doing in verse 10. It's the most powerful manifestation in your life. It's the primary way that God has intended for you to manifest his wisdom, his grace, his love, his plan to the universe. It's through these intimate relationships. Your marriage is the most important dynamic ministry in your life or your intimate relationship, your marriage. I mean, whatever ministry you have. I mean, I have about a ton and a half of ministry outside of my home. So does my wife. There's none of them that even come close in importance from God's perspective as my marriage. So if you're focused all out on your own ministry and not your marriage, then you're putting all of your emphasis on secondary ministry rather than primary. Rather than primary. 
Well, you know, God's always first. And when you put God first, it enables you, if you grow, to give more to your wife in the right way. Well, that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, let the unbeliever go. Your relationship with God is more important than your relationship in your marriage. I mean, marriage is for time. God is forever. So if the unbeliever, he says it clearly, if the unbeliever wants to depart, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, just read that. If the unbeliever wants to depart, let them go. You're free. Now, nobody wants that as a rule. I mean, that's maybe sometimes people want that. But the point, the point being the, the, the goal of the Christian life is to, is to let go of your own human agenda and perspective and goals and ideas about life and happiness and adopt God's. See, if you look at your marriage and your relationships from God's perspective, he has a purpose for it. Now, let's take, we'll get to the page maybe sometime, but maybe. Let's take Jacob. This story, this thing Ron's been teaching lately, Jacob, right? Now, he is in love with Rachel. Got it bad. She must have been a really beautiful girl, and she must have had a backyard swing. <laughs> Something going on that that Jacob found very, very appealing. Now, what human being, especially in this day and time, has not been attracted to somebody early in life they thought was going to be their forever person and later on discovered that that person wasn't good for them anyway? Now, that's a really concise moment in Jacob's life where he, well, what he thought he wanted and would be good for him, God said, no, that won't be good for you because I have a purpose for your marriage, Jacob, that, that transcends all of your human desires, ideas, beliefs. And if you ever get up here from my perspective and look at it, you're going to realize that Leah fulfilled that not Rachel it was Leah Judah came out of Leah right Judah was the line of Messiah that's more way more important than the fact that Jacob had these strong feelings now look I'm all about strong feelings that's great but it doesn't mean that's the will of God for you and your strong feelings I hope that you are, are intimately in love with your partner but God's perspective on your marriage and, and his purpose, his purpose for it is way more important than how you feel about it. Either good or bad. Either good or bad. So, the goal in, as far as marriage for Christians is to start looking at it from God's perspective and, and ask yourself, what does God want to get out of my marriage? You say, we've been at this a long time and we haven't really ironed out and worked out a lot of things. We just come to, seems like a dead end and have to just walk away. Nobody will give. Listen, when nobody will give then everybody's what? Wrong. Wrong. When nobody will give, then, then everybody's out of fellowship. Everybody's got their own ideas about what this is supposed to be or what they want it to be. And forget God and his plan and his purpose for our marriage. Forget that. I mean, I, I, I'm hurt. I'm angry. I'm bitter. I'm jealous, I'm this, I'm that. It's about me. The more we grow, and I speak to some very, very mature Christians in here 
People I admire greatly for your commitment to God's word. It's not many that are so committed that their life revolves around where the church is, where the doctrine is, where the teaching is. There's not many of those people in the world, but we've got some here. I admire that. Listen, our marriage, you need to be committed to make your marriage worthy of the Lord's plan. It's not, a, it, look, it's not just about you and how you feel about it. It's about what God needs from it, what God's doing with it, what God's after from it. And if you, look, if you get with God's plan about what your marriage is for, what, what his, look, it will, it will cause you to humble yourself and give and improve and come together and be the person that God, it will make everything better from the human side too. It will start the journey again. It will start you back into the opening your heart again to reconnect, to work things out. And that's good. That's a very good thing. Now, let's look at this page. For the unmarried, all these principles apply to all close relationships as they have the same dynamics without the sexual component. These studies are also being taught in a home Bible study. I don't know where the rest of that sentence went. Uh, uh, in Moody on Monday nights. In a home Bible study in Moody on Monday nights. So if you have people, in, in especially young people, close to Moody, I've got a little small thing going and I'm trying to attract some more folks. I've sort of slipped in the back door on some Church of the Highlands people and I'm and I'm working on them. So if you got some young people, what would be great is if they would, they would come to it and begin to support and build this thing. That'd be good. So let's look at our paper first. Let's, let's talk about stresses. We're, this is about stress on marriage. There's a ton, listen, the, the devil's world throws the, everything including the kitchen sink at every human being the moment they step into adulthood. I'm watching my own children who have been protected by Rhonda and I and the Lord and their grandparents. They're starting to step out into their own uh, dealing with the world and they're like, wow. I mean, somebody, somebody threw the kitchen sink at me. I mean, I watched it go by. It's like, yep, just get ready. Now, for this purpose of our study, marital stress it will include any form of adversity that faces the relationship with the opportunity to grow together or split apart. Listen, as we've learned, adversity is part of God's plan. Adversity is what he uses to challenge us to grow. We often see it from our human side as a, as a hindrance to our human agenda, as a hindrance to achieving what, what we believe from our initial belief system will make us happy, our first set of dreams. I read a book by Larry Crabb, who is one of my mentors. It's called, the book is called Shattered Dreams. And the point of the book is that your initial human conceived dreams that are all about the worldly system must come to an end. They must crash. They must be shattered so that you can then adopt the ones that God has for you. See, we don't know what, what, what it's all about. We have no idea when we start out. We're just as ignorant as monkeys. I mean... I mean, you're, look, your kids may have, may have gone into adulthood and just zipped right into the spiritual life and they got everything going. <laughs> That's not normal. That's not usual. I will say it that way. That is normal, but it's not usual. So let's look at these differences. First, there's stress of daily adversities. This is just normal finances, health, children, you know, flat tires and late, and late payments. Uh, 
Secondly, the stress of combining personalities in one home. That can be interesting too. Just two different people, two different personalities. If they're a lot alike, then, the trend, then that combining is easier. It's easier. But who wants easier? I mean, it seems that we just go for what's opposite of us so we can fight it out. But somehow we end up that way. Now, thirdly, the stress of combining different traditions and lifestyles. Every home is different. And two people get married, and they don't consider, often don't consider the, back, the home from which the, their partner came and how they grew up and what their parents think and believe in their traditions. I'm dealing with a couple right now. One of the, one of the partners have parents who drink a lot. I mean, a lot. Every day. Case of beer. Okay? And they want to take the grandchild in the car with them. And they're like, <laughs> so that's caused some stress. Because the, the mother in law, the grandmother, it's like, you're making too big a deal out of that. So the couple are like, Think what you want, but, you know, she ain't going. Not with you. Not, in your, not when you've been drinking. And it's bad, so bad that when one of them gets up in the morning, they have, they're shaking and have to, get, have to drink for breakfast. I mean, that's deep in it. Bruce Russell, my dear friend, Gary's dear friend, told me that he used to work with this guy. This guy's one that told me. He said that Bruce would come get him in the morning in the pickup truck. And when he got in the truck, there was a bottle of vodka in between him, a quart. And as they started going down the road, Bruce would take the top off and throw the top out the window. Because they didn't need it anymore before they got to the job. They were going to drink the whole thing for breakfast. He gave, that, he gave the drink up. He really did. He gave it up. So, here's a lifestyle. But see, that's how he grew up. That was his lifestyle. Thirdly, fourthly, the stress of subconscious programming. These are habituated beliefs, defense mechanisms. The subconscious, this is what we call the old man. The old man is that subconscious programming that we adopt at a point in our life and we use it enough that it becomes an automatic process and listen I know some of y'all haven't really given this a fair hearing uh, for whatever reason maybe Bob Thiem didn't teach it or whatever I don't know but it's what Paul taught Romans 6 Romans 12 Ephesians 4 it's all over the place it's important now finally the stress of being the object of spiritual conflict between God and the devil and the evil ones you're right in the middle of that so these are the different ones, and I'm going to come back tomorrow, and we're going to look at these in detail. And we'll look at the human way that we deal with it, how we destroy our marriage through manipulation, through defense mechanisms, through playing games, rather than following God's strategy, unconditional love, fruits of the Spirit. That's the way to build a marriage. This is the way to destroy a marriage so that at the 20, 30-year mark, you're in detente. Detente being <laughs> nobody invades anybody's territory. Everybody stays in their own little realm. You know, we've worked it out so that you do your life and I do my life and we just don't bother anybody. We don't bother each other. That's how we stay married. And that is not victory. That is defeat. I will define defeat as any marriage where both parties have stopped trying to grow into it. Now, if one party is still growing and trying to engage, however subtly, 
there's still movement. God is still in it. But there comes a point when many, many marriages, Christian marriages, people with doctrine, where they just can't make any progress because of this old man subconscious programming that nobody wants to look at and nobody wants to change. Nobody wants to believe. They just want to learn a bunch of stuff and pretend that somehow that's going to make everything okay. And that's, that's, that's horse manure. It's not true. It's not going to work. It's not going to make you a better person. It's going to make you a more knowledgeable person, but it's not going to deal with the stuff that makes you a bad person. Fear, anxiety, worry, anger, bitterness, walls, defense, self-protection. This is all the stuff that we build so that nobody can hurt us. That's not, that's not, Christ, that's not victory. That's sin. Okay? You say, well, that's a pretty hard line. Well, I didn't draw the line. And it's not my line. I mean it just like you. With just as many problems and issues as, is, as anybody. We, you know, we're just trying to honor the Lord, be better people. Just I, I was fortunate to to get into a great family with a great girl who doesn't give up ever. Doesn't give up. See, that's the key to victory. Don't quit. It's the only thing that you really have control over. You just keep digging for the top. All right. So secondly, every intricate detail of earthly life has been foreknown and included in the divine decrees. The divine decrees, if you don't know, are the plan of God that he devised in, in eternity past. He foreknew everything. He doesn't, he doesn't cause everything. He allows much of what occurs through volition and, and results and consequences. But at every little turn, he's in, he's in charge of it, in control of it. And this means that God has stacked the deck in our favor. God has stacked the deck in our favor as to what's going to come about. He already knows what's coming about. He's in charge of what's coming about. He's in charge in your life. Whatever's coming about in your life is from the Lord. Even if the demons caused it, God removed the hedge for a moment and let them in. He's in charge of your life. He's in charge of it. He, everything's got to come across his desk. Job tells us this in Job 1 and 2. Job's a great guy. He's got a hedge around him. He's got everything in there. Boy, he's rocking and rolling. And the devil says, just let me get at him for a little while. God goes, we'll, we'll do a test. That's what all of human history is. It's a visual aid. We're visual aids. So, 2 Kings chapter 6. Would you turn over there with me just right quick? This is a wonderful story if you've not heard it. 2 Kings chapter 6. 15 through 17. Pam, would you get me a cup of tea? Would you get me a cup of tea? Tea up there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Second Kings chapter 6. Look at 15. Now, this is a story about Elisha, who's a prophet to Israel. And the king of Aram, the Arameans, are fighting against Israel, and, and Elisha, God is letting Elisha in on everything that the Aramean king says so that the king of Israel knows where to be and not to be. They keep trying to trap him. The Arameans do. But Elisha can hear, God lets him hear what the man's saying in his private quarters. Thank you so much. I know. So finally, the Arameans figure out where Elisha's going to be, and they send the army, a whole squad, so that when, when his, uh, his 
uh, servant, Elisha's servant, walks out the next that, that morning to get some water or whatever, boom, there's a whole squad of horses and chariots and spears and bows and everything else. And he's like, oh boy, we've had it now. And chapter 6, look at verse 15. Now when the attendant of the man of God, this is Elisha, had risen early, gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to Elisha, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Elisha answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I want you to remember this. I want you to remember this in your marriage. That God has provided resources that are way more than whatever problems you're facing. Whatever you're facing and whatever struggle there is, and listen, people face lots of things. I had another counseling couple where the wife, the guy made a decent living, somewhere between 50 and 100. He made a decent living. His wife secretly got credit cards and spent and spent and spent and spent and, and confronted, boo-hoo-hoo-hoo, never do it again, finally be able to get it all paid off. And while they're paying this one off, guess what? Doing it again. Like the fourth time before they came to me, it's like the fourth time. And he's like, I don't know what to do. Whether I don't know whether to shoot her, <laughs> divorce her, both Christians. He said, I, I, I don't never have a retirement, not a chance. I mean, it's, we're into the $100,000 that we owe somebody, and the interest is incredible. We're bankrupt. We already bankrupted. Point being, that's, that's tough. God says, the resources that I have are more than the problems you're facing. Now, does that mean that God's going to foot the bill for the $100,000? Maybe, maybe not. I'll tell you what he's going to do, though. He's going to foot the bill for them to be able to accept forgiveness and regroup in their relationship, and he's going to be able to forgive her She's going to be able to forgive him for his anger and self-righteousness. Those resources are available. See, victory is not breaking even monetarily. It has nothing to do with victory. It has nothing to do with the spiritual life. Nothing. It has nothing to do with marriage. It's just one aspect of marriage that Hopefully you learn how to manage properly. It it's, brings a lot more joy in your life when you're able to manage that properly. And you don't have to wait, you know. You don't have to be so far in debt. You can't see. But Elijah said in verse 17, Then Elijah prayed and said, O Lord, I pray that you open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike these people blind. You know what he did with them? You think he had them killed? What do you think? Mm -mm. They were all struck blind. He and his attendant actually led them to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said, what should I do with them, father? He called him father. Should I kill them? He said, you treat them like captives. You feed them. You nurture them. You give them grace. You minister to their souls. You evangelize them. You get them saved, which was Israel's purpose anyway. And you send them home. And that's what they did. So, point being, whatever your challenge is, God has provided more than you need to win. But you got to understand what victory is. Victory is the relationship. It's not the money. It's 
It's not the situation. It's not the circumstances. Listen, the battle is in the soul. The whole battle for your life and for God's plan is in your soul. The circumstances of life are nothing more than the the thing than the the things on the stage in which this drama of your life is being played out. Just the uh, just the things on the stage that get rearranged every other day. Who cares? Who cares about any of that? God does not. He is very generous. He is very loving. He's given more to me than I, I, way more than I deserve, more than I ever dreamed that he would do. And he seems to be just getting started. And I'm like, you're crazy. You're crazy good. You're crazy loving. You're just generous. You're over generous. It's wild. But you can't care about all that stuff. You can't care about that stuff. So, this, and listen, what I just described about God's resources, just the protection aspect we just looked at. Thirdly, God has so designed our earthly existence so that both positive and negative experiences, and I'm calling it that from a human perspective, what we call positive and negative, Gary's knee would be one of the negative things, you know, what in the world? Why would this happen? You know, why would this happen? It doesn't seem like a logical thing to, to you know, confine you and, and, and put you out of business for a little while and say, what's the point? What's the purpose? God's got one. He's got one. It's not an accident. No such thing. No such thing. Stop thinking that way. That's human thinking. That's, that's, listen, that's childish thinking. So, everything is intended to be used to bless us, for us to grow and make us more like Christ. Now, I love putting these two passages together. These two passages changed my whole perspective on the Christian life. When I understood that God was using everything, everything that comes down from heaven, from, that comes into your life, has been considered, thought out, pre-planned, and allowed into your life by the, by the plan of God, by God himself. It's there for his purpose. It's not an accident. It's not an unfortunate situation. Listen, and all the people that are listening out there, you married somebody that was opposite of you, and you discovered that y'all didn't like any of the same things. You didn't like the same music, the same TV shows. You didn't like the same colors. You know, one wanted to live in the mountains, one wanted to live on the beach. You know, everything was different, and everything was a struggle. And you think, that was a big mistake. No, it wasn't. Wasn't even close. You you see, you're just looking at it from your human perspective. For many years, I I taught people, for I understood that if you do the, if you follow the plan of God, He'll make your marriage into the greatest thing ever. As if your experience of the greatest thing ever was the core issue of life. Look, it's just a byproduct. It's a neat thing when that happens, and it's something that will happen for you in your soul if you continue to follow the Lord. It won't. It may or may not can be your circumstances. They may fall completely apart. I mean, this partner that you're struggling with may get sick and die, and you may do the rest of this thing alone. And you're like, whew, that's hard. I'd rather have the struggle. And the Lord said, look, this is the path by which I intend for you to honor me. I mean, look, God allows all kinds of stuff. He allows people to get ALS. That's probably the scariest thing, that can, you know, that you slowly, slowly, slowly use all, you know, and you get down to where you can't even move anything. 
Except maybe your eyes. That's a path. You're, you just see, you're still, you're still battling in your soul to accept the will of God, to be grateful for it. Romans, Paul says, we know God causes all things, including knee surgery, old age, everything, to work for good to those who love God. I mean, this is those who are fully committed to Him. This is not the back and forth Christian. See, the back and forth, listen. Y'all listen to me a minute. This passage has been misused so many times. First, because people think the good that's being described in here, it means something pleasant for them. Oh, God's going to turn this into something that I will really, really find pleasant. has nothing to do with what you find pleasant. The good here is for His glory. It's to further His plan. And often that may be adversity in your life. It may be like, oh, gosh, that doesn't look good to me. But it is. If you're, if, see, if your heart is tuned into His, it's, you, you're going, I'm down with this. I'm with you, Father. I'm with you. Now, anything and everything that happens is part of the plan and is under His control. It's designed for you. It's meant for you. The thing that you keep complaining about, that you're unhappy about in your life, this thing that keeps coming back that you can't get rid of, that He won't take away, He's left it there for you to grow because of it. Because of it. The things that are in front of us, that are in front of you that you think, I don't want that to happen. I don't want it to be that way. He said, these things are happening for my glory and your growth in that order. So, James says, rejoice, fellow believers, when you encounter various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be mature, complete, lacking in nothing. When you know that all the stresses that have been allowed onto your marriage are intended to make it stronger, you can anticipate these things and embrace them when they come. Can you imagine some adversity coming into your marriage? And you, instead of fighting it and complaining about it and struggling with it, if you were to embrace it as a gift from God, that that would become the impetus for you to grow and become stronger and to have more insight and to become more on God's view of things instead of your own. See, the goal is to get your heart into his and look at all of this from his side. Let your side go. That way you become a servant. You become empty of yourself. And your, he said, it's not me who lives, but who? Christ who lives in me. That's the idea, that we get to that place. And when we look at our marriage from that perspective, listen, when a man looks at his wife from there, it's a phenomenal thing. He quits taking everything personal and he starts to nurture her and behave toward her in a way that looks like Jesus, that acts like Jesus, that's intended for her to be benefited. Everything's for her benefit, not his, not mine. Now that's a mature place. It's where we're trying to get to. Look, in order to get to there, you, the, all these old ideas that are about me, 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 me have to be let go of. So, knowing that all the stresses that it come to your marriage are intended to make it stronger, you can embrace them. You can actually use them. You, when you see them coming, you go, wow, okay. What are we going to learn today, Father? How, how are we going to be challenged today so that we can find the middle ground and compromise with each other and, and, and obey you and honor you and become like you toward each other so the angels 
that are watching us can go, what in the world is that? You know, they don't get to see it very often. And I don't think they get to see it very often. I know they had not seen it in my life yet, not from my side. I'm still trying to get there. Quit thinking about myself. What I've got and what I didn't get. Oh, it's so complicated and complex. Self, your selfish nature, we call it the sin nature, makes you selfish. It makes you put self first. Sees adversity as a frustration to your, to your plan. So we're afraid because our default plan for happiness, our human happiness, our human plan, it's our human agenda. This image of our circumstances arranged as we wish. I mean, look, you look into your, you look in your mind and you've got all the things that you own arranged and placed where you want them. All of it's cleaned up and repaired and fixed and going and working properly and you've got this image in your mind that says, all right, finally got everything where it's supposed to be. And the Lord's like, you're like the rich fool. You're like the rich fool. Just focused on your stuff. Your stuff. Fourthly, this is part of what we'll talk tomorrow. Years of using human devices and mechanisms seeking to improve your marriage eventuates in total failure. It eventuates in fatigue. And we tend to give up on the marriage. We use human devices, human mechanisms, trying to improve or change our marriage. And ultimately, we come to a place of, like I said, detente at best, where nobody's, everybody's in their own space. And we get, we get tired. We just get tired of trying. We get tired of being rejected. We get tired of running into a brick wall with our partner, and we just decide, forget it. You know, I'm just going to go find something to entertain me, to fill up my time while I'm here, and I'm not going to divorce. I mean, i got no justification for that, but there's no point in continuing to pursue this. And that's a total lie. It's a form of sin and it destroys whatever possibility of honoring the Lord that there is in this thing. One, let me give you a few ways that we try. We try to manipulate. We try to induce change to accommodate your desire. If you would just be this way, if you would just stop acting this way and, and become this way, then everything would be all right. And the other person says, well, you know, if you'd start, if you'd stop trying to change me and accept me the way I am, I think everything would be all right. But maybe y'all know while we're at it, there's a few things I'd get like to get you to change. So we go about working on each other, observing each other's good and bad points, enumerating them, making lists in our mind at least, keeping score building walls, trying to change each other. Listen, even God doesn't try to change people. He just takes what you give him. He offers you the opportunity to become more. And that's what we have to learn to do with our partners in any relationship is to give them the freedom to give what they want to give and be content with that until they're able to give more. But often, listen, often we have holes in our own development that we're trying to get that person to fill. In psychology, they call it finishing your business. Where you didn't get your business finished with your parents, they didn't give you everything you needed to become a whole person, so you keep trying to squeeze it out of your partner 
And marriage is not meant for that. Marriage is meant to reveal your weaknesses. It's not meant to fix them. It's meant to reveal them. Bob Theme used to say, never understood it, marriage is not for happiness. Marriage is for the development of virtue. Marriage is the revealer of your weaknesses and the holes in your development that, that enables you to see yourself so that you might use the grace of God to develop within and use God as your parent, as your mate, to grow and become a whole, mature, Christ-like person between you and only you and God can make that happen. This person over here, the best they can do is cheerlead, encourage, maybe even point out a few things if you're open to that. Most of us aren't. Most of us take all that very personal. We see it as criticism rather than help. But second, we use complaining. Complain, complain, complain. Somehow we think if we show that person, our mate, how unhappy we are about their behavior, that it will cause them to change. Now, how's that working for you? <laughs> how's it working for you? Doesn't work. All it does, all it does is create hard feelings. All it does is tempt that other person to build resentment. I mean, they're over here giving their best, what they think is their best. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. They're over here pouring out what they think is their best. And it's never good enough. Ever. Oh, that was great, except that was great, but for complain. Listen, you're complaining about your partner. All it does is drive them away. All it does is make them feel less than they are. It just, it just beats them down. It doesn't help anybody. Thirdly, withdrawing. Withdrawing. This is, listen, this is, this, this strategy can be as hurtful and harmful as any kind of abuse. Any kind of abuse. I'm not for abuse in any form, but this is a form of abuse. Now, there's reasons to withdraw that says, I'm overloaded. I need to withdraw and, re and, 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 and digest what's happening so that I can speak rationally. But you tell your partner, hey, i got to walk away for a minute or for a day. Let me think about it. Let me get back to myself because I'm overloaded. And that's an honorable but. When you can't win or you can't negotiate and find middle ground and compromise and you, your way, you just, then you just shut down. You take your toys and go home. Except you're already home. <laughs> and you can't get away. Can't get away. So you just withdraw as a, re, as a means of hurting the other person. You use it as a weapon. I mean, you withdraw in every area. You withdraw sexually. You withdraw emotionally. You withdraw. It's terrible. Listen, it's abuse. It's abuse. The idea that only men can abuse is ridiculous. Women can abuse men. It just as hurtfully and just as harmfully as men abuse women. Don't think it's true. It goes both ways. Don't think it can't be that way. Don't think it's not true. It is. Listen, men are not invulnerable. Men are not. 
pieces of wood without feelings. Men are, are, can be very, very sensitive and open and loving and giving, and when they're rejected and when they're uh, beat up because they're not good enough, it's very hurtful to them. This is the human system. This is what it comes to. This is why you got to abandon it. It's what comes out of your old man's stuff that you've programmed, what you saw your parents do that got programmed into you that you've now brought into your marriage. That stuff's got to go. It's got to go. And listen, I'll just tell you straight, if you're not willing to look at it and you're not willing to admit that it's there and deal with it in a real way, then you will simply lose in your Christian life. You will end up in the great at the judgment seat of Christ with very little. Very little. Undoing the old man stuff is the key to being able to use the doctrine to make the doctrine you not use it as just some tool over there for it to become you. That's the goal. That's the goal. So, counseling <laughs> can be a form of manipulation. I don't know how many people have come wanting me to whip their partner into shape. They come. And I go, all right, who's, gonna, who's going first? And one or the other will, will open up a whole array of complaints about their partner. Both, it goes both ways. And they simply <laughs> embarrass and expose their partner like on the first date. I mean, we're just now getting to know each other. And the next thing you know, this guy has been described or this girl has been described as an evil person who snuck up on me and married me just to destroy my life. And I'm like, well, you're not looking at this from your own perspective, are you? Finally threatening, threatening to leave, threatening to divorce. I'll just go have an affair. You know, if you won't love me, I'll find somebody else that will. Somebody that would leave the asset, you know, take or leave the assets. Rhonda and I said, whoever leaves has to take the kids. So that's enough to keep anybody from leaving. <laughs> these are things that it's important to, to recognize in your life, and these are things that everyone does. Listen, I'm not, I, I, know, I'm, I know I'm being a little dramatic about that stuff, but these are important things to look at in your life to see, am I doing that? Because you get older and you get more subtle about everything. You've gotten to where you can keep everything kind of in, in its place. You don't throw, you know, everything's not, but you're subtly disapproving of your partner. You've never been able to get them to come up to your standard, your idea of what they're supposed to be. So you've learned to sort of live with it. And so you look at them from over here and you judge them and you wish they were more than they were. And you just kind of, Look down on them from your perch. Now, you're not going to divorce them, and you, you're kind of glad that God gave them to you, but you just wish they were different and better. You just wish they were different because they're not like you. And you've gotten stuck in your human agenda, and what you're wanting from this person is for them to fulfill this human agenda, this image in your mind of what marriage should be. And because they can't do that, and by the way, nobody can. You, you've, you've decided to be unhappy about it. And the truth is, is that God gave you this person for a divine purpose that is so much more important than how you feel about this. It can't be discussed. How you feel about this, and you use that as the criteria for determining and evaluating your marriage is a joke. It's a joke. This is about God. It's about God 
you giving God your life and your heart and your soul and surrendering to Him to be the person that appears, that, make, that becomes the image of Christ to the church, that becomes the image of the church to the Lord, so that when other people and unbelievers see your life and your love, they see God and what God, the relationship God wants to have with them. That's what we're after here. That's where we're trying to go here. Now, and look, taking two different people and jamming them together to become one. There are so many skid marks along the way to try to get to that place. I, I look, I'm in it. I know. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't stop your human. Look for these things, these human ways of leveraging, these human ways of trying to get change. Look, you got to let go and let them change. Is un- but they're so they go so slow. You say they go so slow. Well, you get this one life. And everybody gets to live it as under the Lord. They get to do it the way they want to do it. And nobody can, nobody gets to judge that. Romans 14, 12 says that when we stand before the Lord in the judgment seat of Christ, we're all going to give an account about ourselves. Nobody else. Yeah, nobody else. I can't say, well, you know, Rhonda just never would get with the program. You know, Al just never would get with the program. God ain't going to ask about that. He's going to say, Al, what did you do? Did you become like me and you give that to your lovely wife? Is that what you did? I'm going to go, sir, I, I, I stayed after it as long as from the day I learned about it and understood what the goal was, what the purpose was, I stayed after it as far as, went as far as I could go. I mean, if you give me a little more time, I might have got farther, but, but I don't want to go back. Thank you. Ain't going back. Listen, I hope this has been helpful to you. And uh, if you'll come back tomorrow night, we'll, we'll do some other things connected with this. And, uh, Maybe it'll be helpful to you. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're grateful for all that you've given us. We're grateful for our marriages and for those of us who've been married and, and, and are widowed or we've lived a single life. There's all kinds of lives that you've allowed, Father, you've put in our, our path. And it's all kinds of paths to walk. I pray that what we said tonight will be helpful in some way to a relationship, to a marriage, to become more like you, Father, to become to, to see our marriage from your perspective and see its purpose from your perspective, to align our hearts with what you want from us in our marriage rather than ourselves. And so we're grateful, and we just praise you in, in Christ's name. Amen.